competency to stand trial. This is a different law. It's a pretty common forensic issue. MCL 330, right? This is the Michigan law. A defendant to criminal charges shall be presumed competent to stand trial. He shall be determined incompetent to stand trial only if he is incapable because of a mental condition, mental disease or defect, the law likes to say, of understanding the nature and object of the proceedings against him or of assisting in the defense in a rational manner. The ability to perform the tasks reasonably necessary for him to perform in the preparation of his defense and during trial. Basically, the question that I have to answer, so that's what happens when you're a forensic psychologist. You look at the law, you pull out a couple of questions, and then you have to do the evaluation, gather the data. It's a very sort of empirical process. You gather the data to answer the question. So the answer to the question that I ask, have to answer, I mean, in competency is, number one, does this person have a mental disease or defect? And in the case law, it's either mental illness, not every, you know, not every mental illness, you ha not just because you have mental illness means you're not competent, okay? But first, my first question, do they have a mental disease or defect? Do they have a mental illness and, or, or do they have mental retardation? The second question, because of that condition, did the person have an, not, or not have an understanding of the nature and object of the proceedings against him? So if you came into court and you had an IQ of 51, you're moderately mentally retarded, right? You may, you, you definitely um, um, probably would read at the kindergarten level. Would you be able to understand what was going on in a criminal proceeding? And the other part is, because of a mental disease or defect, is this person not able to assist in their defense in a rational manner? Okay. Now, competency to stand trial doesn't work very often either. In fact, it's only successful about 15% of the time. So let's say we do your competency evaluation. And we, the examiner says, um, this person's not competent to stand trial. Then what happens is, is the court says, okay, can Jeff, can this person be restored to competency? And then I have to provide an opinion based on the science behind the mental illness. Can we do treatment or education with this person and make them competent? And different laws say different things. In Michigan, I think it's 15 months. So I have to provide an opinion to the court whether or not we can restore this person to competency in 15 months. Let's say we can. Then they go into a restoration program um, through the Department of Corrections here in Michigan, typically. And then they get treatment. So for example, if someone has schizophrenia and they're not able to sit in the chair because they're flipping out because of their symptoms, and we get them on medications, and we give them some counseling to understand their illness, and we get them competent to stay in trial, now we can have the trial. <clears throat> There are some situations where the person's not competent. Just last week, I saw a 13-year-old who was accused of um, assault, took a, um, a box cutter after his mom. Yeah. He had an IQ of like 51. He had um, an endocrine disorder. What? He had an endocrine disorder that affected his thinking ability, so he had a medical problem that affected his thinking ability. Um, I made the opinion after you do specific competency testing, you talk to the person about what does a judge do, and they tell you, and you also, there's all kinds of specific competency testing. If you were in court and A, B, and C happened, what would you do, A, B, C, or D? And you see what their knowledge level is. Well, this, this kid um, didn't really have the brain power to be able to even learn that stuff. And because of the endocrine disorder, um, he was impaired to the point where um, he just was not going to be able to conform his behavior um, to what they, you know, to, to um, be able to sit in court and contribute to the defense. So I made the opinion he wasn't competent to stand trial, and it was there was not a reasonable likelihood that he could be restored to competency within the statutory amount of time. Um, the prosecutor accepted it, and then they dropped the charges. 
So if you're not competent to stand trial, um, you, can't, you, you can't go through with the trial. Now, you also have to be competent to be executed. So anybody want to guess what two states have very well-funded, wonderful competency restoration programs? Texas and California, he says. Texas and Florida. If you're found not competent to stay in trial in Texas, you go live in a nice prison, go to class every day, um, and they do a, a really comprehensive, good competency evaluation or competency restoration. Because you can't, you know, and they, I think, I might misspeak, but I know those states tend to have a, um, a tradition of, of having um, maybe more capital cases than other, maybe there's another state that's kind of moved in, but those, those two kind of have the, the stereotype of that. Um, juvenile competency to stay in trial. In Michigan, up until 2013, we had to apply the, the adult statute of competency to kids. And about, at this time, about 50% of the states, and by the way, most of the states define competency the same way. The wording might be a little different, but it's pretty much the same. There's a whole history of things called the dusky standards and all kinds of other things we could, we could get into, but it's kind of beyond our discussion today, that really served to develop the idea of what competency is as a construct. In Michigan, up until 2013, I would see juveniles who would come in, and their cases were a lot more complicated. So if you're 15, your brain's not mature yet, and you have a learning disability, and you've got some problems at home, and you've got some ADHD, maybe you've got fetal alcohol syndrome, um, are you competent to stand trial? Those cases, be, and there's a whole aspect of emotional maturity. So those cases would be very complicated, um, and we didn't really have a good statute to base things on. In 2013, um, the Michigan legislature, and I'm a big critic of state legislatures. I've got some stories. They usually make bizarre laws that aren't even applicable. Not usually, but sometimes. Um, they came up with a great law that outlined all the things that we need to do. We need to give everybody an IQ test who's a juvenile and we do competency eval. You have to be a qualified forensic examiner. So I had to go to a specific training in Ann Arbor about how to do these, even though I'd been doing them for 10 years. And our restoration, uh, we found them not competent, was 120 days, four months. Because I'd have these problems where I'd get these 15-year-olds with learning disabilities that would do something wrong. And, um, and I look at the adult statute and I'd say, okay, so how much is this kid going to mature from 15 to 16 and a half? And it became even more complicated. Here they say if you can't restore competency in four months, four months? Yeah, three months. No, four months. Four months, right? Um, then you have to drop the charges. Um, they also outline other specific tests of competency relevant just to juveniles. Did they have the, an ability to extend thinking into the future? Well, if you take adolescent development or child psychology, child development, or even in your PY201, your general psychology, you're going to learn that um, there's a whole thing called hypothetical thinking. And on a good day, that's, that's wired in by 12. But not everybody's having a good day, right? So some kids, they don't get that until later. And some might not even get it at all. So one of the, the hallmarks of adolescence is not being able to see in the future, right? Okay. So we have to actually look at that and try to measure that. And then verbal articulation abilities or the ability to express oneself. So it's going to be important to assist in your defense. You're going to have to be able to communicate with your attorney. So now under the juvenile competency statute, we have to look at those specific things and provide an opinion and attach that opinion to our overall opinion on whether or not the person's competent or not. So the concept of competency to stand trial that I outlined uh, in the, the lecture that you just saw is based on uh, what's called the, the Dusky Standard. There is a slide in your uh, packet outlining the Dusky Standard, and that's from the case Dusky versus United States, 1960. That case established the idea that competency is really based on three things. And if you see in the slide, it's based on understanding. It's secondly based on appreciation. And third, it's based on reasoning. Now, the idea of competency to stand trial 
in the UK is called fitness to plead. Now fitness to plead actually was uh, established as a procedure uh, in the courts in the UK decades before the Dusky Standard, believe it or not. You'll see also a slide where fitness to plead is outlined in Alderson versus Pritchard in the UK. Now if you look at this slide, it talks about an accused will be unfit to plead if he is unable to, if you just look and I'll paraphrase, comprehend, uh, to know that he might challenge jurors, to comprehend the evidence, and to give proper instructions to his legal representation, or legal uh, representatives. So again, this is a, another concept, competency to stand trial or fitness to plead. It is applied in a similar fashion or understood in a similar fashion in the United States courts as it is in the UK. Australia and Canada basically follow the, 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 the same standards in order to assess whether or not someone is competent to stand trial. There are some differences among the, the four countries and what happens to an individual who's considered not competent to stand trial. Um, there are some procedural differences about how to um, establish uh, whether or not someone is competent to stand trial, and that varies uh, among the different courts. But the concept of competency to stand trial or fitness to plead is similar in all four countries. One last thing, I talked in, in the video clip a little bit about juvenile justice. Uh, the way that forensic psychology is applied to juveniles, as you can imagine, varies a great deal uh, when you compare the United States to other countries. In the United States, particularly in the past 25 years, uh, there has been um, sort of a very um, strong, some would argue harsh, approach to uh, juvenile justice and the way that we um, uh, treat, um, process, and, and really try to understand uh, persons who are under 18 who commit crimes. I could do a, an entire webinar on juvenile justice <laughs> in the United States uh, versus other countries. In fact, if, if that's a webinar that you think would be interesting, um, let me know or let the hosting company know. Maybe I can do a webinar on that. Uh, talking uh, and going into detail about how competency is applied in juvenile justice is, is sort of beyond the scope of this particular webinar, but it's a, it's a fascinating area that uh, still continues to develop. 